Our speaker today needs no introduction, so I'll, I'll keep this short. Dr. Cox has been a professor at PHC since 2006. Before, before coming to PHC, he was an associate professor of Bible and theology at Emanuel College in Franklin Springs, Georgia. As you know, he teaches courses in Bible and theology here at PHC. He lives near Winchester, Virginia, on a small farm with his wife and seven children. Those of you who know him, and that's virtually all of you, know that Dr. Cox loves chainsaws, tractors, and Jesus. Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and he also loves his students and seeks to live out a godly example of faithfulness as he teaches his students. And today, I am confident, will be no exception. I'm grateful for what Dr. Cox does here at PHC, and I am excited to welcome him here to the podium to deliver this semester's Faith and Reason Lecture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daryl Cox. My little Welsh legs requires that this come from there to here. <laughs> All right. Uh, first off, I just want to uh, greet uh, Samuel G. He's a potential student uh, who's with admissions today. So um, welcome. Uh, it's so wonderful that you're able to be here. And others who are joining us as guests and so forth, once again, warm welcome to you. And uh, uh, may the Lord bless you and, 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 and hopefully all of us together, maybe we'd be edified in his presence. Um, for those who have not already been introduced to the abstract, I'll just go ahead and just touch on the, uh, the highlights. And namely, the, the title is the character, rather, character, the necessary foundation of calling. And accordingly, I'll, I'll give what you saw in, the, uh, in that abstract once again for the benefit of those who have not had access to it. The world gauges success in life by measures of power, wealth, and influence. Often Christians consciously and unconsciously adopt these cultural measures when evaluating their walk with God, relationships, and God-given callings. Left uncorrected, false standards of success end in frustration and disillusionment and ultimately wastes the precious gift of time that we steward. In this lecture, I seek to demonstrate that the accurate measure of success is authentic character transformation, rooted in our walk with God, uh, as well as, I'm sorry, rooted in our walk with God and community within the context and gifting of our God-ordained calling. Our calling, or vocation, is the superstructure built upon the foundation of character. How we live as disciples of the kingdom of God on the local level is the true and enduring measure of success in this age and eternity. Only as we are safely established on the foundation of our character can we serve in the superstructure of our vocations as salt and light in our culture and as God permits in the world at large. What comes to your mind when I state the following? You've been recruited to be part of something so much bigger than yourself that it will define and consume you until your innermost being is transformed by it. What if you also knew that entrance to this thing would cost you everything? Various friends, some family, plans, ambitions. Moreover, you're guaranteed to be hated by others, misunderstood, mistreated, and reviled. Yet this cause will also connect you deeply with other recruits. You will suffer greatly, but you will also know unspeakable joy. 
both as a foretaste in this age and for all eternity. At times you will feel like the biggest failure and no personal defeat. At other times you will witness victories that resound into eternity. Your heart will overflow, grateful to be worthy to suffer for this cause. Would you join? Well, obviously I'm talking about the kingdom of God. Foundationally, the kingdom is his righteous will and reign over all existence, supremely manifest in this age through his son Jesus Christ, bridegroom and head of the church. Let us briefly consider the nature of this kingdom. Jesus repeatedly described it as something that by all rights appears upside down. Concerning the bestowal of honor, the first shall be last and the last first. In terms of the hierarchy of this kingdom, the greatest will be the least and the servant of others. This kingdom is marked by an unequivocal call to live a life of love and forgiveness, not just towards those deemed worthy recipients of such virtues, but also towards enemies who actively seek one's harm. Furthermore, its citizens are commanded to lend, expecting nothing in return. Go the extra mile, even under compulsion, and undergo insult and indignity without retaliation. Amid Christ's teachings to his disciples, receive a, we receive a brief glimpse of the basis for the seemingly odd nature of this kingdom. Quoting Jesus from Luke 6, If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the exact same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your father is merciful. The ethics of the kingdom of God are rooted, as we can see above, in the very character and nature of God himself. He is kind and merciful even to the ungrateful and evil. In its full manifestation, God's kingdom is permeated with the atmosphere of his divine presence shown in perfect fruit, as Paul points to in Galatians 5. The apostle Paul points to the effects of God's presence when he declares to the believers in Rome, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Such a kingdom appears upside down to us because it reveals God and stands in vivid contrast to all that post-fall humans have become and cherish concerning God, neighbor, and even oneself. Accordingly, we read, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed Jesus. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourself before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Even the apostle Peter, well intended and certain he understood the means for Christ's fulfillment of the Father's will for the kingdom, was at one point met with the sharp rebuke, get behind me, Satan, you're a hindrance to me. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. Here we see that the kingdom of God is not realized and apprehended by unaided human perception, as Peter was doing, or by even right reason. Instead, this kingdom is marked by a willing self-surrender to God's perfect rule and reign. In other words, the things of God. 
This surrender is likewise expressed in the divinely instructed petition, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our identity as sons and daughters of this kingdom provides purpose and meaning to everything in our existence. That sentence alone, I could read over and over to myself every day the rest of my life. Therefore, it is crucial to recognize that admittance and citizenship in the kingdom are not predicated on anything that we possess or can do in ourselves, but rather on a spiritual rebirth that comes from willing surrender to Jesus Christ. Thus, nothing is more critical than obedient submission to the kingdom. Such daily submission is the pathway to growth in character as sons and daughters of the kingdom. We all likely witnessed the tragic, horrible event in Miami in which deficiencies in a building's foundation brought an entire superstructure crashing down. The damage and ensuing loss in life were ghastly to observe, but not surprising once structural engineers disclosed the foundational deficiencies. Interestingly, Jesus drew from just such language to illustrate spiritual principles when he declared, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. We are builders in every moment of our life, every moment of our life. If all we prepare, live, and labor towards is success in our calling, we build on a weak and dangerous foundation. Character which is one's walk with God, is the foundation for our lives. Now, I just want to take a little uh, clarification on that uh, statement, walk with God. The expression walk with God is not Christian jargon. Rather, it is an Old Testament Semitic idiom that refers to the character and conduct of one's life. For example, it's used in reference to Enoch, who walked with God and was no more, for God took him. Genesis 5. This expression is brought over in multiple places in the New Testament with such phrases as, do not walk after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 8, Galatians 5. The idiom is used of Enoch once again in Hebrews 11 as one having pleased God, and it gives us even for further detail pleased God in fellowship with him through faith. What we do in serving God, one's calling or vocation, is the superstructure that rests upon the foundation of character. The devil is not so concerned about an individual's vocation or calling. He will gl gladly grant one apparent success and fulfillment in life if that's all you desire. It is our character in God that causes dark powers in this age to tremble. Education plays an essential role in character formation. Sadly, we sometimes think of education in a utilitarian manner and settle for far, far too little of what God has planned for us. We may approach our educational degree as something of a union card. Our sight and expectations must be much higher and more focused. Our aim and preparation is to learn to become effective at what we do in our emerging sense of divine purpose and calling and to learn to walk with God closely on a daily basis. 
there is no other way to be safe in ourselves and safe in our relationships with others. Such character preparation is the end towards which God intends a healthy education. A crucial component was lacking in the early years of my life's training. My father passed away when I was three and my mother never remarried. Accordingly, I did not know what it was like to have the benefits of an earthly father. My mom did her best alone with three children. Thankfully, I had a brother eight years older than me who kind of, we did a lot together. But she, um, she sent me out to various other farms to be mentored by individuals belonging to her generation, as well as to her father's generation. He, he had been a generational farmer. Although I acquired a great deal of knowledge, skill, and experience in farming, <laughs> I'm laughing because I almost got killed numerous times, none of these individuals who trained me were as a father, <laughs> kind of follows. Um, well, <laughs> maybe I better take a little drink here. <laughs> One of the very first ways God revealed himself to me in his kingdom was as a father to the fatherless. This is seen in Psalm 68. As a new follower of Christ, I began gradually to exercise self-discipline exercise self and self-control that had previously been absolutely absent in, in my life. The reality of God as my father was so powerful that it transformed me from within, sculpting my character. Where there had once been spiritual silence, God drew near and spoke to me through his word by the Holy Spirit. His presence as my father was also there to impart his very nature, as 2 Peter 1.4 describes. Things I previously loved, I strangely began to hate. And things I previously hated, I now began to love. In this way, he took an active role in imparting, disciplining, and edifying me just as a father does. During those early years, one of the most influential figures that God brought into my life was a proxy spiritual father. An older man of God, born and raised in Israel. His name was Costader. It was through him that God brought even further discipline and impartation into my life. God used this spiritual father to teach me that authentic spiritual transformation is noetic in very large respect. I began to understand what had already been taking place in my life, that the renewal of the mind with truth can and does lead directly to a significant change of our innermost being, our heart, our spirit, so to use biblical parlance. As noted shortly after becoming a follower of Christ, I was introduced to the presence of God in a new way. This was totally unexpected, you guys. This manifest presence was wholly unexpected and stayed with me day and night for quite an extended period of time. Over time, however, this heightened manifestation of God's presence would periodically cease just as unexpectedly as it had begun. I was such a young believer at the time that I feared I had somehow displeased and grieved the Lord. It was particularly troubling that I could not identify what I had done wrong to displease him. Now, I want to make a quick disclaimer. Please, please note, testimonies along these lines are not normative and can be unhelpful if interpreted the wrong way. God does not work in precisely the same ways and patterns in his children. He doesn't. Though he does seek the same outcomes in maturing and transforming us all into the image of his son. That's what's normative. In my case, the manifestation of God's presence had, among many other things, successfully served to wean me away from the seductive pleasures of sin. When God later began periodically to withdraw, so to speak, use that language, his presence, I eventually realized it was an act of love and wisdom intended for my well-being. Just as God, in wisdom, had initially imparted such a rich foretaste of his kingdom presence, so now he began to withdraw himself, not to forsake me, but rather to enable me to grow up in 
him. More specifically, I quickly learned from scripture, it is the father's good will and desire that his children trust and obey him, particularly during those times when we cannot sense his presence or hear his voice. We honor and please God immensely in this manner and in ways that I'm still discovering to this day. It was a significant step forward in my walk with God to realize that my mind and with it my heart's affections were intended to be instrumental in drawing me near to God through the transforming power of the truth. For example, I began to understand the need and biblical responsibility for me to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ rather than waiting for God to manifest his presence and deliver me as he had in fact done in the beginning of my walk with him. God was no longer going to carry me along in matters in which he intended for me to walk in the obedience of faith. Again, it was time to grow up in Christ. I likewise began to realize the numerous ways that sin and its bondage could be traced back to my mind again. More specifically, ways in which I had believed a lie rather than the truth, whether about God, my neighbor, the world, and indeed even myself. Some of those lies I deliberately told myself. It's bad enough to lie to others, but lying to oneself kind of closes the door of the mind. Sins I previously did not even recognize as such began to be exposed and purified in the transforming light of truth. It was beneficial to come to understand that sin, again, this is happening in my mind, the noetic effects of transformation, to become, to be able to understand that sin was a violation of God's very character and nature and therefore his laws, which are a codification of his very character, nature, being. And that sin had been manifesting itself in me as attempts to meet legitimate, God-ordained needs, however, in an illegitimate manner. Once again, I saw the necessity of my responsibility to cooperate with God in repentance and actively renounce the false substitutes I had embraced in his place. Gradually, I began to experience liberty from sin in areas of my life that I had not even known were bondage. I was and still am right now, being transformed in, into conformity with the legal status established through covenantal union with Christ. It would be years before I understood this work of the Holy Spirit as something God's people have long described as progressive sanctification in Christ-likeness. With this new realization of the connection between the heart and the mind, I also began to view education in a whole new light. I learned that while it is good to be highly educated, it is better to be educated from on high. But, it's best to have both. God intends education to be transformative and impart spiritual truth in our lives. It is for this reason that he places a high premium on it. While it is indeed costly to obtain an education, living a life of ignorance, you guys, and walking in darkness is far, far, far more costly. How one lives in community is a direct reflection of one's walk with God. He deliberately uses things like roommates, siblings, and other challenges of living in community as a form of divine boot camp. God will often deal with crucial spiritual principles like authority, forgiveness, and self-giving love in the context of community to transform and shape our attitudes. In this respect, I'm referring to the visible assembly of God's people, the local church, as well as all the many people God has placed in one's life. Are we persistently harsh, abrupt, and dismissive toward others? 
Are we discourteous, cold, and callous? Do we only show respect and warmth of kindness to friends and those whom we perceive as power or influence? These questions can be challenging to face, but how we answer them reveals crucial things about our walk with God, awakening us to facets of our character to which we are otherwise blind. This is an area where you can benefit even from criticism intended to tear you down. In seeking your harm, some individuals may reveal truths that loved ones and very close friends will not disclose because they do not want to hurt you. They love you. Harsh criticism is incredibly tough to navigate. It requires that we find a deep rest in God to discern the truth in the midst of destructive, a destructive context. You will no doubt meet people who are certain God has endowed them with the gift of criticism. I am confident that if they turn this gift on themselves for one solid day, they would be cured of it in short order. How we treat other people is not only a direct reflection of our walk with God, but will determine our effectiveness in leadership, as Costa Dare illustrated in one anecdote. He notes, there was a man who was a skilled administrator. Notice vocation? He's very skilled over a large and significant institution where students attended from all over the world. The staff and instructors were among the best. Students came from various places to study God's word and prepare for ministry. On one hand, this skilled administrator was highly degreed. On the other hand, he lacked positive influence because he was often insensitive, rude, and even harsh in the way that he treated his subordinates. His problem was evident to all. He failed to establish and operate out of relationship. He operated out of position with a domineering spirit which caused the Institute's spiritual morale to sink to an incredibly low ebb, forcing him to resign. Unless respect, kindness, and integrity characterize a leader's disposition, he fails to relate to his people in a healthy and inspiring manner. Moreover, how one lives in community constitutes God's preparation for a potential spouse and family. Now you guys are going, yes, <laughs> now we're on topic. Do you stubbornly insist on having your own way? Is it crucial that you are always right? Are you willing to prefer others over yourself? Do you readily forgive others as well as ask forgiveness? If we have teachable hearts within the divine crucible of community, hard attitudes can, and I'll add, will be shaped in such a fashion that they bless our most intimate relationships, present and, God permitting, future. Character development takes time. Accordingly, there's no need to rush through formal education. There are good and time-honored reasons why educational programs last several years. Treasure this time that God calls you to be students. God has provided this season for you dig, to dig the foundation of your character deep and lay it solid. A foundation on which you will build the rest of your lives. Your education is intended to be woven into the very fabric of your character, which, to reiterate, is your walk with God. Be careful about treating classes, particularly subjects towards which you may not be drawn, as items to just simply check off a list. Accordingly, accordingly there is no such thing as a boring class. Instead, these are divine opportunities to be taught and transformed by God, if you will but seize them. Every topic is filled with holy awe and wonder if we will be receptive in heart and mind as God's children. It is your inheritance in Christ to be taught by him. 
As the Apostle John explicitly describes, as for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. The following admonitions are intended to address growth in character. Some are along the lines of things to avoid, while others address things actively to pursue. Number one, growth means fleeing the temptation to measure success as the world does. At times, success may look like a failure in the world's eyes. Remember, what is highly valued among men is detestable to God. As the Apostle, Paul once, or the Apostle John once again declares, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Isn't that beautiful? One can achieve great things in and through higher education while altogether leaving out the foundational growth of character in one's walk with God. What a travesty. Our only safety, brothers and sisters, is to have God's heart imparted to us by seeking him on a daily basis. Number two, growth requires deep, settled convictions. We do not typically lack self-discipline, but instead settled convictions. We usually do exactly what we want with our time, the most precious resource that God has given us to steward. We can only walk in faith and obedience when it arises from deeply settled convictions. These, in turn, are formed from a deliberate and earnest study of God's word and seeking him daily. I'm just hitting the high points of it. A lot more, as you guys can discern, can be teased out from these. Number three, growth requires that first things must remain first. Experts in any field become proficient by learning to do the basics well and keeping them foundational and central in their lives. I understand this principle is true in golf. I've tried golf and I, I don't know, I sooner or later get impatient and decide to see how far I can send that ball. But I understand it's true in golf. I know firsthand it's true in motocross, observe trials, and high school wrestling. Never cease to practice the essentials in walking with God. They must become such a part of our lives and practice that they develop as muscle memory. Walking with God, God requires daily slipping away from the crowds to seek him in the solitude of prayer. Spending substantial time in scripture as well as worshiping and giving thanks to him throughout the day. We must never treat these practices as something we outgrow, but as elementary and foundational to everything, everything that we do in life. Number four, growth involves a price that must be willing to pay. One more aside, paying a price to walk with God by no means implies that we can add anything to the work of Christ, which is all sufficient for salvation. Rather, it is in reference to our willingness to lay aside every weight to appropriate and receive in ever increasing measure what Christ has already made possible through union with him. We must hunger not only for an experience, or rather, I would argue, not for an experience, but rather for a close fellowship with the living God who desires for us to lay aside other things in our yearning for and seeking after him. As God's image and likeness, we are created to reflect him and express similitude to him in every area of our lives. With the Lord, it really is all or nothing. He's not into that whole lukewarm type stuff. 
He seeks for nothing less than his rightful due, a living sacrifice. Wholehearted longing and seeking after the Lord is a reoccurring theme across the landscape of Old Testament and New Testament scriptures. Indeed, it's embedded within the very fabric of redemptive history, meaning it's something of a motif. Note just a brief sampling, Psalm 42. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. Just a quick aside. Have you guys ever seen a deer visibly panting in thirst? You ever seen one? I, I have, right up close. It's a heck of a thing. I mean, you know they are thirsty and about to die. Um, sorry. Uh, it was up close. I should not have added that. Um, James 4, come near to God and he will come near to you. Hebrews 11, without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. I love Acts 17, Mars Hill, Areopagus. From one man, the apostle Paul declares, he, God, made every nation of man that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set for them in exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And as it finishes out, as your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Jeremiah 29. This is the Lord speaking in the first person through Jeremiah. You will seek me and find me. When you seek for me with all of your heart. Why is this the case? We have divided hearts and varying degrees of mixture in our lives. God wants all our heart's affection that we might in turn impart, or that rather he might in turn impart his own heart to our emptiness. When we humble ourselves, cry out in desperate hunger to God with all our heart and desire him above all else, heaven will not be denied and hell cannot stop what God will do in drawing near to us. Is that your heart's longing today? Seeking the Lord and having him draw near is not a one-time event, nor is it mere emotional experience to be scorned as some weird sectarian, sectarian extremism or embraced as enhancing one's spiritual reputation in the sight of others. Moreover, God is not some kind of divine tease who invites us to draw near to him wholeheartedly, only to hide himself and leave us broken, empty, and disappointed. No. To be aglow with his spirit, that's Romans 12 in the RSV, is the very purpose for which we have been created and recreated in Christ. This is God's plan, his longing, his intention. Besides, what are the alternatives to this earnest seeking after the Lord? Without it, Christians do tend to fall into a form of evangelical deism, so to speak, attempting to live in the strength of their own natural abilities. Such individuals will either become self-righteous, particularly if they possess a strong natural constitution, or perpetually succumb to a cycle of sin marked by despair, marked by repentance, back to sin again. Both responses are denial of God's loving imminence in our lives. Are you not of high standing among your peers? Indeed, even heavy laden with inadequacies, I do have good news for you. You're in a good position to receive from the Lord. As we'll see, God delights in showing favor to those, to such as you, provided you look to him in earnest. As the Lord graciously self-discloses to us, these are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word, Isaiah 66. 
Elsewhere, Jesus declares, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Apostle Paul likewise captures this same reality when he called on the Corinthian believers to engage in some self-reflection precisely along these lines. Brothers and sisters, Paul writes, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. To what end? So that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. In his own life and ministry, Paul learned directly from the Lord that power is perfected in weakness. And therefore he delighted and boasted all the more gladly in his weaknesses in order that Christ's power would rest upon him. What a contrast to current measures of success, huh? There is no way around it. God is pleased to draw near to those who in their inadequacies and weakness draw near to him. Conversely, he actively opposes those who walk in pride and self-sufficiency. It is our way of saying at any given time that we do not particularly need or desire the Lord, to which God responds at that moment, so be it. How many of you are grateful, though, that the Lord does not leave us in such a foolish place. Huh? I welcome all of God's discipline and dealings that awaken my heart afresh toward him. I've heard it said, (laughs) idiots are people who don't do what I do. Maniacs are people who do what I don't do. Most people are both. Such a message is the last thing, however, I intend to convey in this presentation. An attitude or notion that I have somehow arrived? Absolutely not. I am a fellow disciple of Jesus undergoing sanctification among you. However, while there are many things one can fake in life, experience is not one. Fly fishing is one. Whether it is the person practicing medicine without training or something with less deadly consequences, reality always has a way of catching up and revealing the level of one's experience. As an older brother among you, and I have never said that before, I am compelled to share some principles about walking with God that I have learned from Scripture and, indeed, experience over the years. Some from positive obedience. Others from turning right when I should have turned left. Not politically. (laughs) These are just the highlights I could go for days and days. Number one, as noted, do not live in isolation from community. We already touched on this, but I want to tease out a couple more items. Self-reliance can be helpful when expressed in skill sets. But when it prevents one from being clothed in humility and loving service to others, it it wreaks spiritual havoc. Indeed, it can become a form of prideful individualism. We need one another generally, and we need the visible assembly of believers, the local church particularly. While a Christian learning community such as ours is by no means a replacement for a local church, it is populated by members of the body of Christ, universal and hopefully local. Therefore, such a parachurch organization is jurisdictionally under the authority of Christ's kingdom and is part of the community that God has placed in our lives for character growth. Number two, have at least one person in your life with whom you can be utterly transparent without fear of rejection. This person should either be the, of the same gender or be one's spouse. With such a person you can Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. James 5. 
This person must demonstrate that he or she is trustworthy, is neither a gossip nor a busybody. Moreover, do not entrust or trust or entrust yourself to just anyone or multiple people for that matter. Over the course of your lifetime, if you have two or three trustworthy individuals you can count as a friend closer than a brother or sister, you have done well. Number three, as noted already, readily forgive others, indeed even your enemies, and humbly ask for forgiveness of others when necessary. As a rule, those who have been forgiven much by the Lord joyfully forgive others. However, in seeking reconciliation in relationships, be careful not to dump your spiritual trash at someone's door. This has happened to me, and I have inadvertently done it as well. well. What do I mean by this? For the sake of time, go into detail and confession only to the degree that it's necessary to restore broken relationships. Don't get crazy about it. Avoid unduly burdening your hearer. Number four, help those who are weak and honor others' giftings and callings in the Lord. Remember the nature of the kingdom. We are not in competition with one another, except to outdo one another in showing honor. And that's Romans 12 in the NASB. I like the way it renders it. Never seek your own glory or honor in any situation or circumstance. It's not about us. It's about him. Jesus himself declared, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing in John 8. He sought only to glorify the Father. And in turn, we see that the Father and the Spirit glorify the Son. Consequently, using Trinitarian language, there is but one who is worthy of all glory and honor. It is his due alone. Be jealous for his glory, and you will gradually find yourself entrusted by him with the glory of his presence, as he so deems it. At the very least, at least envision the stress from which you'll free yourself and your life if we'll but obey God along these lines. Here's the rule of thumb. Treating individuals you perceive can add nothing to your reputation or standing among others is a direct thermometer of your attitude toward God. If you find yourself perpetually seeking to endear yourself to people of power and influence or seeking a place of honor at the proverbial dinner banquet, Luke 14, be aware that such activity is in opposition to the spirit of Christ, a servant spirit. An older man who had been used extensively by the Lord in training Christian leaders around the globe was invited to preach at a church one Sunday morning. The pastor got up and introduced him to the congregation as a great man of God. When the older man took the pulpit, he immediately declared, I love your pastor dearly, but he has made a grave error this morning. He introduced me as a great man of God. Rather, I am the man of a great God. The emphasis must always be on the Lord, not on the man. This older man's response demonstrated that his heart had a revelation of the greatness and the glory of the Lord whom he served. And this in turn serves as a divine antidote to pride and self-glory. Again, the Lord describes himself with the, Lord, with the words, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Isaiah 57. Isn't that beautiful? Number five, seek the Lord in the manner he desires, which is primarily without fanfare. And that's not just my northeastern uh, not wanting your emotions to just let it all hang out type temperament. I'm trying to just hopefully reflect what, what God has revealed is desirous on his part. 
This may sound strange to you, so perhaps I should break it down. When you pray and seek the Lord, do so primarily in secret, and our Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. That's found in Matthew 6. The same principle is taught by Jesus when you fast or when you give to others. Do so in secret. Such an admonition is not intended to preclude or in any manner diminish the God-ordained contexts of engaging with others in prayer and worship in communal settings. I suppose one could say that the activities of our private walk with the Lord should be akin to the first rule of fight club. You do not talk about it to others. Nor should you put it on public display for any manner of human recognition and approval. The Lord typically does not share man's appreciation for projecting spiritual appearances. Number six, keep your lives free from the love of money. The acquisition of money and possessions is one of the primary measures of success in the world. Yet, money is by no means evil, nor is it even a necessary evil. I will defer to our resident econ economists here, but as far as I've been able to determine, money is at bottom a means to exchange the gift of time that God has given to all men and women. Being good stewards of such a gift is a blessing, not something evil. It is part of the dominion mandate, reaching back to Genesis 1, 26 and 28. However, our extraordinary capacity to distort any good is especially susceptible to money. The challenge we face in exercising such stewardship is one of gradual displacement. We can never serve two masters. If money gradually takes the preeminence in our lives, we will subtly come to despise the Lord crash upon the rocks of idolatry and founder in the shipwreck of our faith. Why do I raise this issue? The health and wealth gospels, idolatrous teachings never die. They merely morph and move to new cover. The apostle Paul confronted it in his day and warned Timothy as follows. People who want to get rich, rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 1 Timothy 6. The Lord would save us from this. Number seven. Do not live by your emotions, but instead, instead continually submit them to the Lord and walk by faith, a faith that manifests itself through obedience. And just a little aside here, I want to note, this is in no way implying that individuals who suffer in their emotions are necessarily lacking in faith. For a helpful guide in this complex but incredibly important issue, see Dwight L. Carlson. Why do Christians shoot their wounded, helping, not hurting those with emotional difficulties? Yet, emotions can be volatile. We cannot afford to wait until we feel good about seeking and obeying God and loving others before we do it. Such an approach is not hypocrisy or fakery, but rather a spiritual principle illustrated by Jesus repeatedly and numerous times, the truth of which God has graciously demonstrated repeatedly in countless lives. As yet an older, another older man of God once noted, I love this, or I wouldn't have included it, I suppose. The most trying time is the most helpful time. Beloved, if you read the scriptures, you will never find anything about an easy time. And if you are really reconstructed, it will be in a hard time. It will not be in a singing meeting, but at a time when you think all things are dried up and that there is no hope for you. Then is the time that God makes the man or woman. When we are tried by fire, God purges us, takes the dross away, 
and brings forth pure gold. Only melted gold is useful. Only moistened clay receives the mold. Only softened wax receives the seal. Only broken, contrite hearts receive the mark of, as the potter turns us on his wheel. We must have the stamp of our blessed Lord who was marred more than any other human being. He was truly the son of God with power, with blessing, with life. He could take the weakest and make them strong. It helps to keep things in perspective to know that the biochemi- on the bi- biochemical level, well, emotional responses are physiological. Yet, human emotions are a God-ordained and necessary part of our human constitution. And a grim, stoic view of them can often result in what Dallas Willard described as an incipient form of body hatred. Still, emotions must be rightly ordered. They are neither fit nor suited in themselves to be an arbiter in discerning truth from error, the holy from the profane. Number eight, dig your own well in God who alone is living water. I'm going to drink some water. And point number one, I urged you not to live in isolation. Yet one cannot rely entirely on the community of believers to draw near to God. I used to work in the trades, which included installing below-ground irrigation systems. Once there was a water shortage due to a prolonged drought in the region. The lake reservoir was dropping to dangerous levels. The city officials made city water conservation mandatory. This meant no washing cars or watering the lawns with city water. One man, however, apparently persisted in doing both. A neighbor by the name of Karen finally had enough of it and called the police. When the police arrived at the man's house, his vehicle was still wet from washing and the lawn was a vibrant and healthy green unlike the brown ground surrounding his property. The officers knocked on his door and were fully prepared to write him a citation for breaking the city ordinance on water conservation. The man who answered the door sensed the gravity of the situation and immediately invited the officers into the house. Now this almost sounds spooky from today's standards, but not so much. He asked them to follow him into his basement. That is spooky. (laughs) Uh, I didn't realize that. Where he pointed something out. His house had initially been built outside city limits. It had its own well, dug deep and brimming with water. When the city grew and expanded its boundaries to include his house and property, he was required to attach his house to the city's water supply. He explained to the officers that during times of drought, he had not been drawing from the diminished reservoir, but from his own well. With the evidence of his well pump clearly running right there in front of him, the officers apologized for the misunderstanding and bothered the man no further. Living and interacting in community is akin to drinking city water. Collective worship is city water. Gathering together for corporate prayer with others is city water. What we are doing right now in the Faith and Reason Lecture is city water. These are good and God-ordained components of growth in him. However, we must simultaneously dig our own wells in God. When seasons of spiritual drought come, and they will, city water will will only take us so far before it runs out. Seeking God both individually and communally converges in inward stability and outward steadfastness of character. While accountability shores up our character, only the Holy Spirit can produce that inward steadfastness. So we seek the Lord wholeheartedly through both of these means toward rest in him. This present generation is arising at a critical time. 
And while crisis is nothing new to humanity, each new generation faces old temptations in new guises. New voices in an age-old manner loudly calling attention and allegiance away from their rightful focus. In contemporary contexts, you will face the same temptations as previous generations to quantify success by the reach of your power, wealth, or influence. The temptation is one of being seduced by the spirit of this age, as per Ephesians 2.2. 2. In contrast, you've been called by God to be sons and daughters of an upside-down kingdom, the ethics of which are rooted in God's very character and nature. It is the Father's good will that we grow up in Christ, seeking him on a daily basis and thereby becoming established in our character, which is the foundation of the superstructure that comprises our service to the Lord and others. Or in other words, calling or vocation. A crucial element of character formation is the renewal of our minds through the principles and truth of God's word. Moreover, I admonish you to settle for nothing less than to seek the Lord daily with all your heart as he invites us. For character is our walk with God. That is your only safety with God. It's your only safety with others and it's the only safety with yourself. Stir your heart and mind to become so enthralled with the Lord that his kingdom and presence are your greatest longing. In this way, he will draw near to you and the foundation of your character will be solid and safe to uphold the weight of the superstructure of God's calling in your lives. Only as we are safely established on the foundation of our character can we permit or rather, can we serve in the superstructure of our vocations as salt and light in our culture and as God permits the world at large? Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>